And sometimes in Christian circles, they say we're doing it for the Lord's work. What is God's way in the area of money? The answer is in Jesus Christ. Did Jesus even once in his life take an offering after he preached or before he preached? Did he even once in his life after he healed the sick take an offering before he healed or after he healed? Now the apostles followed Jesus Christ. Did the apostles ever do it to take an offering or pass a collection bag around? No. Where have these practices come from? They've come from Europe and America. And most Indians blindly imitate the Americans. In fact, most of the world blindly imitates the Americans in whatever they do. That must be the right way. The musicians imitate American musicians. The dancers imitate American dancers. In politics, they imitate the American way, and Christians imitate the Americans. They think that's the best way. India is full of it. Indian Christendom is full of it. We say, but it's for a good cause. Exactly. The end justifies the means. It doesn't matter how we get there. It doesn't matter if we don't do it like Jesus and the apostles did it, so long as our goal is good. That's exactly what the devil says. Don't worry about how you get there. The thing is to get there. Imagine if Jesus had adopted that method. He'd have violated every law of God while trying to save souls. Is it right to adopt any possible method to save souls? Oh, if that's the case, then you can hold a gun to their head and say, come on, yield your life to Christ. <laughs> you can be as stupid as that. In the olden days, some Christian missionaries of certain denominations did that. They converted people by the sword. It wasn't a conversion. I want to say that to be a witness for Christ in this age means that I must have nothing of this world's values. When the devil says, I'll give you this, what do you want? You want souls? You want to build your church? Bow down to me, I'll tell you how to have a big church. And you say, no thank you, I'm not going to adopt your methods. I'd rather live with a small church and follow the principles of God's word. In the area of money, what is God's way? Jesus taught us. In the Old Testament, it was different. It was an earthly kingdom, and the Lord taught them that you must come and give your 10% out there, and if you don't give the 10%, even the last prophet in the Old Testament said, Malachi, you'll be cursed. But the moment you come to the heavenly way, from the day of Pentecost, when the kingdom of heaven came, it's entirely different. Now God says, you don't have to give me anything. No tithe, no one percent, nothing. God loves a cheerful giver. And if you cheerfully can give zero, that's all he wants. He wants happiness, he wants cheerfulness. He doesn't want anything, he doesn't want your life, he doesn't want anything that you cannot give cheerfully. Because what you don't give cheerfully is a dead work. You need to understand dead, dead works if you want to understand God's ways. In the Old Testament, they did not have this understanding. If you read through the entire Old Testament, the phrase dead works is not even found there. There was only good works and evil works. If you paid your tithe, that was a good work. If you didn't pay your tithe, that was an evil work. But in the New Testament, there's another category, good works, evil works, and dead works. And I'll tell you, 90% of Christians or 99% of them don't even know what dead works are. Do you know what they are? We need to understand God's ways. Dead works are works, good works, done with a wrong motive. For example, preaching is a very good thing. You can preach to bless people, and there are many people who preach wonderful sermons to bless people, but if their motive is to get money, it's a dead work. If their motive is to get honor, it's a dead work, and particularly Christian singers and musicians. It's much easier to preach a sermon for God's glory than to sing for God's glory. When we sing, we are so conscious of our, ourselves and our voice and the melodious nature of our voice. 
I suppose preachers can be tempted too, but singers much more, musicians much more, how well they can play. And it may be wonderful singing, but if the glory is for oneself, it's a dead work. And you know what the Bible says in Hebrews? We've got to repent of dead works. You want to understand God's ways? Repent of dead works. Motive is so important. You'll see in the final day when we stand before the Lord, the question will not be, what did you do? The question will be, why did you do it? Do you know the difference between what did you do and why did you do it? That's the, in the Old Testament, there was no question of why did you do it? Did you do it? Supposing a man was coming to pay his tithe and with a long face and said to the Levite, I don't feel like giving this 10%, but God has said I've got to give it. Okay, here it is. He had obeyed the law. There was no law which said you must give your tithe cheerfully. No. Because there was no such thing as dead works in the Old Testament. And if you have not understood dead works, my brother, sister, you are still under the Old Covenant. They didn't have understanding about dead works there. They did not examine their motives in the Old Testament. And if you never examine your motives, you're under the Old Covenant. Another dead work is where you do something under pressure. Somebody forces you, forces you to pay your tithe or put some type of pressure on you to do something, come to the prayer meeting, go house to house evangelism, come out into the streets and preach with me, and you reluctantly go with no desire to go, you may preach, you may do house to house evangelism, the whole thing is a dead work. Come on, here are a hundred tracks, distribute them before next Sunday, and you somehow manage to get rid of the hundred tracks. Dead works! You may impress your leader, who is stupid enough to tell you to do such things, but you don't impress God. God loves a cheerful giver of anything. Obedience, he wants it done cheerfully. In the Old Testament, God treated us like, God treated people like babies, like little children. In the New Covenant, he treats us like adults. You read that in Galatians 3 and 4. I don't have time to show it. You read it sometime. Then we were like children. Now we are like sons. The early part of Galatians 4, it says there, the difference between children and sons is the difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant. Children, we don't wait for cheerful obedience. If you wait for cheerful obedience, you'll never get your children to obey. I never waited for my children to obey cheerfully. I said, whether you're cheerful or not, you better do what daddy says. That's it. That's the only way to get them to obey, even to come to a meeting. If they said, if one of my boys said to me one day, I don't feel like coming to the meeting, whether we feel like it or not, you're coming. But when they grow up and become sons, I don't talk to them like that. Do you? Do you tell your 25-year-old son whether you feel like doing it or not, do it? That's the difference between a child and a son. And that's the difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, whether you feel like it or not, you've got to keep the Passover. Whether you feel like it or not, you have to go to Jerusalem three times a year. It was all like that. Whether you feel like it or not, you have to pay your tithe. Whether you feel like it or not, you have to give a sacrifice for your sin. There was no question of whether you feel it like it or not. But in the New Covenant, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross. There's no such thing as you must take up your cross. You must give. The reason I'm asking you is, Dear brothers and sisters, have you understood this as a fundamental principle of God's ways? If you do something out of somebody manipulating you, it's a dead work. I believe most of the speaking in tongues that I have heard in Pentecostal circus is all a dead work. I've heard sometimes people speaking in tongues openly in the meeting and uh, on the internet and it's usually the same phrases the same five or six phrases that are repeated by everybody what is that is that a language it's a counterfeit 90 percent of the tongues i've heard is counterfeit because they were manipulated there is a genuine gift of tongues 
God gives it to those. When God gave me that gift, I didn't seek for it. But for me, it's a language. It's a language, not a repeating of two, three syllables. A language which, with which I can speak to God. Because I didn't seek for it. Nobody pressurized me into it. Don't look for it. If, you, if God gives it to you, sovereignly take it. But where you're waiting desperately, you know there are some people who desperately, oh, I've got to get into this tongues club somehow or the other. And then somebody will pressurize you into it and you babble something and say, I got it. You got nothing, brother. You just deceived yourself. Forget it. Some of those people who never spoke in tongues are a million times better than you. The Lord of dead works in so many areas. For example, when a person is, somebody prays for someone and he's not healed. And he's told, no, you must confess that you're healed. It's a dead work. How in the world can he say he's healed when he's not healed? Does God tell us to tell lies? But yet, I've heard this numerous times in Pentecostal charismatic circles. Oh, brother, confess. I prayed for you. Now you're healed. Don't say you're sick. Say I'm healthy. So much of deception. And so many people blindly accept it. When Jesus healed, prayed for a blind man. Do you know that all the people Jesus prayed for were healed instantly, except one? There was only one person in the Gospels for whom Jesus had to pray twice. He never had to pray twice for anybody. But why was there one case in Mark chapter 8 where Jesus had to pray twice? And that was not because he couldn't do it in one shot. Because he wanted to teach us a lesson, especially in the 20th century. And what was that? He prayed for this blind man. He laid hands on him, prayed for him. He said, can you see properly? He says, no. Men and trees look alike. Can you imagine how blind a man is if he thinks a man is a tree? And this guy says, Jesus prayed for him. Jesus did pray for him. What did Jesus say? No, 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 don't say you can't see. Say how you can see. I mean, if he was like one of today's pastors, that's what he would have said. Don't confess, I prayed for you. I'm Jesus, son of God, I prayed for you. How can you say you can't see? Say I can see clearly. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? That's where I say a lot of today's Christian leaders are not like Jesus Christ. Why are so many Christians deceived by the teaching of these leaders. Remember what I said yesterday? If you don't study the Bible, you deserve to be deceived. If you don't follow the example of Jesus, you deserve to be deceived. The example of Jesus is so clear. Jesus said, you can't see? Fine. I pray for you again. Prayed for him again. Now can you see? Yeah, now I see everything clearly. Let me tell you this, my brothers and sisters. Jesus never wants you to tell a lie. Jesus never wants you to say that you can see when you can't see or that you don't have any pain when you have pain or that you're healed when you're sick. Don't be deceived by all these lies. The, the devil is the father of lies. And if you confess that you're healed when you're not healed, you're listening to the devil, the father of lies. God never wants us to confess that we're healed when we're not healed. We can confess our hope. Sure. Hope is that which I have not yet seen. I will be like Jesus when he comes again. To say that I'm already like Jesus, that's a lie. You can say, I believe God will heal me. That's okay. So these are many, many examples, I'm telling you, of dead works. Works done with no joy. Works done reluctantly because some preacher pressurized you to do something. Get rid of it. Don't become a slave of men. Understand God's ways that God has no value for those things. Let me give you another example. Supposing you go to God in prayer or you put some money in the offering box and you have not settled matters with your wife. You had a disagreement with her and you spoke rudely or with your husband and you go to pray, I would advise you not to open your mouth and not to put money in the box 
because God will not accept your prayer or your money. We used to have a verse on our offering box some time ago which said, be reconciled to your brother first. Be reconciled to your sister first in front of the offering box. You know, that means a man's going to put a few rupees into the box and he suddenly sees that verse and puts it back into his pocket. We were trying to stop people from putting money into the box. And we still are trying to do that. Because we say, if you're not reconciled, there's somebody against whom you have a tension. Some, you hurt somebody. I'm not saying somebody's got something against you. The world is full of people who've got something against Christians. I mean, India's full of Christians who've got something against me. Israel was full of people who had something against Jesus. People are against Paul everywhere. I'm not talking about that. Have you hurt somebody? That's the question. Not hurt somebody because you preach the word of God, but in a selfish way, you got angry with someone for something concerning yourself. What if you put money in the offering box, it's no better than putting it in the toilet and flushing it down. God will not accept it. You pray, your prayer will not go beyond the roof. You need to understand God's ways. In God's ways, God does not accept anything a person gives, prayer, money, service, nothing, if his heart is not clear in his relationship with other people that those whom he has hurt, he goes and asks forgiveness from. Now, if you go to that person and ask forgiveness and he says, I'm not going to forgive you, well, that's your responsibility is over. Then it is between him and God. You have asked forgiveness, your, your responsibility is over. There are so much of dead works that are going on in Christendom. And if you want to go a higher level of dead works, you know, this is what I've explained to you of dead works is the kindergarten level. As you go on with God, you discover dead works at a higher level and higher level and higher level. You can go all the way to PhD in the Christian life. Let me give you an example. Supposing you want to serve God unselfishly, sacrificially you want to do something and you don't spend time listening to God you're busy serving him it's a dead work and the classic example of that is in Luke chapter 10 verse 38 to 42 Martha busy who was she cooking food for not for herself she was sacrificing, making food for 13 people, Jesus and his 12 disciples, sweating away in that hot kitchen, working hard, working hard, working hard, working hard, but inwardly having a complaint against Mary for not coming and helping her in the kitchen. And she comes to Jesus and Jesus says, Martha, <laughs> let me paraphrase his words. You think I want all your food? You think I'm impressed with all your sacrificial service? Not at all. Not at all. You think I'm ungrateful to you for not being thankful for all the work you're doing for me in the kitchen? I don't want that work. I don't want all your service for me. Mary has known what is the one thing that is needful. Luke 10, 42. One thing is needful. Sit at my feet and listen to me. And then do what I tell you. That's a higher level of dead works. I'll give you an example. Supposing you're employed in an office and your first day you're going to work, you got a contract and you got selected for the job and you go to the office. And as soon as you go to the office, you begin to do whatever you feel like doing, go to this table and pick up some file and start dealing with that and go somewhere else and do this, that and the other. And you don't go to the boss and say, what do you want me to do? You'll be sacked in one day. What do you do? You go to the office and say, what do you want me to do? That's what Mary did. If you had a maid servant working in your house and she never asked you what, you're, what she's supposed to do, just went around doing all types of things, you wouldn't keep her for long. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2 in the Living Bible says the most important thing about a servant is that he does just what his master tells him to. That's how Jesus lived his life. He listened. He listened. Father, what do you want me to do? 
You read a great example of that at the end of Luke chapter 4, where there was a great revival going on, so many people getting healed through his ministry. Everybody wanted him there. But before he met them, he had already met the father in the morning. And the father had told him, go somewhere else. And so when the people pressurized him, you got to stay here, Lord. There's a great revival going on. No, I have to go somewhere else. If you can yield to the pressure of human beings without listening to the voice of God, all that you do for God will be a dead work. I faced a lot of that in my life. A lot of people pressurize me to go here, do this, do that, do the other thing. Well, I say, sorry. I'll do what God tells me to do. I mean, you can think I'm unreasonable or proud or you can think whatever you like, but I'll only do what God tells me to do. I'll only go where God tells me to go. And I've seen the result of that in the last 35 years of not listening to the advice of men as to where to go and where not to go. And I've seen the blessedness in the last 35 years of going only where God tells me to go. And I'll tell you this, that's how Jesus lived. These are God's ways. God's ways are not just run around doing something for God. Jesus taught us to pray, Father, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. How, are God's, how is God's work done in heaven? The angels don't go around doing something for God. You know, people sometimes tell others, new people, why don't you do something for God? Can you imagine Michael telling Gabriel, why don't you go and do something for God? No, it's, heaven is not like that. They wait on God. They do what many Christians don't do. Waiting on the Lord. Those who wait upon the Lord shall exchange their strength, Isaiah 40, 31. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. While other people are just trying to climb that mountain, those who wait on the Lord fly over the mountain like an eagle and go to their destination a hundred times quicker than these people who are climbing up the mountain. It's much better to wait on the Lord and listen to what he has to say. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Are you mounting up with wings like eagles and crossing mountains or are you walking over that mountain? When you wait on the Lord and listen to him, that's how Jesus was. I mean, see a classic example of that. The devil tells him, turn the stones into bread. And he says, I mean, if he had used his reason, he'd have said, yeah, reason says I'm hungry. I haven't eaten for 40 days. There's no sin in eating bread. God has given me power. I've been anointed 40 days ago. I have the power to turn stones into bread. I'm not cheating anybody. I'm not stealing anybody else's bread. These are just rocks. And there are hundreds of rocks here. One rock disappearing and becoming bread won't make any difference. And let me turn these stones into bread and satisfy me. I'm sure my father will be quite happy with my using my power like that. Jesus did not do it. He did not live by reason. He told the devil, sorry, I haven't heard any word from my father to turn the stones into bread. If he tells me, I'll do it, but I haven't heard any word from him. So even though my reason says it's okay, I'm not cheating anybody, I'm not deceiving anyone, I'm not stealing, and I need it, all these things are true, but my father has not told me to do it. How many Christians live like that? Most Christians live by, I need it, and if I don't cheat anybody, I'm not stealing, I go, and go ahead and do it. I don't need to wait for God to tell me. Well, I agree, that is the kindergarten level. When you're in kindergarten, you don't wait for such things, but when you go on with the Lord, you do come to the place where you really want God to lead you in everything. Why didn't Jesus go for a vacation to Rome? Is there anything wrong in a believer having a vacation? I mean, Jesus could have used a reason why I've been slogging away for one whole year, day and night, day and night, many sleepless nights, serving, 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 serving. I need a little break. I think I'll take a break and go to Rome. I won't sin. Do you think Jesus would have sinned if he had gone to Rome? No, never. He wouldn't have sinned anywhere in the world. Why didn't he go to Rome for a vacation just to relax as a servant of God who's exhausted? I'll tell you why. The father never told him. 
He would not have sinned by going to Rome, but he'd have missed God's will. And perhaps instead of staying three and a half years on earth, he'd have had to stay four years to complete the job. How long does it take to go through school? Twelve years? It can take fifteen years also, you know that. It can take twenty years. I know people who have gone to medical school which should finish in five years and take ten years to go through medical school. And God has allotted a job for you in a certain amount of time. You can take ten times that time because sometimes you just do a lot of other things which are not sinful. But you feel like doing it. There are a lot of dead works in Christendom. But you may say, oh boy, then my life will be full of tension. No, it won't. Do you think Jesus' life was full of tension? That was the most relaxed life any human being ever lived on this earth. Tension comes to you because you do your own thing. I can tell you, my life is not tense. No. If you listen to God, your life will not be tense. When you listen to God, you come to rest. God's voice always brings rest, not tension. The reason I'm mentioning all this is, in Jesus I see God's ways, the way he did it. But for that to happen in us, he has to break us. You know, one of the first things that you read about Jesus after he grew to the age of 30 was his going to the baptism. And we heard about it yesterday too. Jesus could have reasoned and said, I don't need to be baptized. John the Baptist publicly saying, I preach a baptism of repentance. He called it a baptism of repentance. What did Jesus have to repent of in 30 years? Not a single sin. He had nothing to repent of. Why did he need that baptism? There was no need. He could have used his reason and said, if I stand in that line, of people waiting to get baptized, people will think, ah, so perhaps there is some secret sin in his life also. I don't want people to misunderstand me, so I will not stand in that line. He never used his reason. The father said, go and get baptized. Father, who shall I be baptized by? Somebody less holier than you, John the Baptist less holier than me? It's going to baptize me? Why not I just go into a tub or something and baptize myself because there's nobody holier than me on the earth? No. Humble yourself. Go and be baptized by somebody who's not even one percent as holy as you. And he comes to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, boy, I need to be baptized from you. No, Jesus says, I have to fulfill all righteousness. For him, righteousness was obeying the Father, not his reason. He never lived by reason. You know, from the time of our childhood, we've been taught to live by reason. And in many matters, that is right. Many earthly things, it's right to use our reason. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But when we get born again and are filled with the Holy Spirit, you want to understand God's ways? The Holy Spirit must now guide our reason. Till now, reason was the Lord of the house. But when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit becomes Lord. And reason, we don't eliminate reason, reason becomes like the wife and the Holy Spirit's like the husband. Is a wife a very useful person to have? Yes or no? I say yes. But not if she becomes the head of the house. No. Then you have a problem. Because God never made a woman to be a head. And God never made our reason and our mind to be the head. It doesn't mean we shoot the wife. We don't shoot our reason. There are some people who say, leave your mind blank. That's not Christianity. That's yoga. Meditation, leave your mind blank. I don't leave my mind blank when I meditate. The devil will come in. 
I meditate on God's word. I use my reason, but under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's the wonderful thing about the New Covenant. They could not have it in the Old Testament. You see, the mistakes that people made in the Old Testament was all because of reason. I told you about Abraham. He came to Canaan, and there was a famine there. He used his reason and said, what shall I do? I heard there's food in Egypt. Let me go there. And he goes there and brings Hagar, and that's the cause of 